Hey everybody, sorry for the uh, the weird uh, video resolution right now, but I'm going to let the winner of the $100 AMC gift card know that they've won. And we are here at Fantastic Studios in Charlotte. I think I've got Nick. Hey, Nick, oh, what's going what's on? Up? This is Nick from Def Andrews. What's going on? And uh, Mike has won the $100 gift card, so we're gonna go sneak in there. Nick has helped me out. He doesn't know yet, so. He doesn't know yet. This is gonna be great. This is also Fantastic Studios. They're not paying us for this. We should probably try to get a sponsor for yeah, Fantastic maybe. right now. Wait, did you, you see the logo in there? Yeah, 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 I got the logo in there. Yeah, they're gonna be great. All right, so we're gonna bust in on their band practice because Mike won it. Here we go. Let's uh, find out, here we go. Woo! What's going on, everybody? Uh, what's up, Tom? What's going on? What's Mike, going on, man? I don't know if you realize this, but you just won the $100 AMC gift card. What? Yeah! 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 So, Mike, are you taking all of us to go, or is it, no, is it she? No, not a chance. <laughs> I have taken me, myself, and my girlfriend. Oh, there you go. Wait, wait. Mike, once again, the winner of the $100 AMC gift card. Woo! And so this is a nice setup. I, my half of my garage is uh, my studio. I have a green screen and I have all the sound deadening. It doesn't it sounds pretty much. This sounds pretty good. So <laughs> well, it's weird. I anytime I go into a house. Or a room or a place or anything. I always do the like, okay, is it vaulted ceilings? How does it sound? Are we yeah. looking? <laughs> like it's I don't look at how it looks uh what would a drum kit sound like in this room? <laughs> yeah. I always want to know what does a drum kit sound like in this room. <laughs> but uh so for the green screen stuff that you do, so because I know that you do a lot of video tons of video production. Yes. So is that what would that you say that is that the main aspect of what you do? Yeah, I've always had that set up actually. Okay. Particularly the green screen setup. Uh going on like 10 years I've had a part of my garage or all of my garage depending where I'm living right. being being a green screen because um, that's basically what I've done is remote video production I call myself a broadcaster video producer podcaster and musician okay so too many strings to the to the bow oh man that's <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta do as many as you can yeah and uh you're doing a lot of work now with the between two pints I've watched a few of those that's really <laughs> awesome I mean, what I mean, it's just great. It's like let's just sit down, have a beer, figure out who this person is. You know, it's it's great, and it's and the the marketing and everything that's going on with uh, the football club and being involved in that. It's yeah. so cool to watch watch all of that build. I'm so excited about it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. So we started the the team started in December 2019, Charlotte FC, that is right. Um, and I kind of came on board at that point to sort of do some of the content stuff and we started off doing these videos at big ben's pub in south end mm -hmm. uh, where we'd interview people and then COVID happened and then it became sort of a virtual uh <laughs> pub basically right so, uh, exactly yeah it's uh it's, it's it's a good little franchise we had there and i'm trying trying to be a bit creative with the stuff we do there right yeah do you uh and and you guys i've been trying to keep up with it do you guys have a timeline as far as when you're expecting to start yeah games yeah so it'll be march 22 it was okay. put back it was it was supposed to be like starting imminently but due yeah. to covid they put it back a year which was frustrating for the fans who wanted it to start now but mm. given what's happening with sport and what's happening with soccer i think it was a good decision yeah yeah absolutely yeah. well and it, it's it's tough it's you know you build up for something and you know even even as awesome as the rollout for announcing the name and everything that you guys did to uh you know to really start pushing the club you know and 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 the minting and the, just all the all of the the marketing of it is just it got me so excited for it and of course you know the world world shut down unfortunately yeah. but i'm nerding out a little bit i've been wanting to i've been wanting to get out of the house and go to the stadium and start getting into something new yeah we'll <laughs> see you at some games that would be great i can't uh, man i can't wait to do it i'll have no idea what's happening <laughs> i'm gonna have to start looking up on my phone like okay did what was the penalty what was that for is that what was that penalty for so how long i i may have caught an accent may have got a slight oh, accent. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, huh. I didn't think any of us had accents. Yeah. Well, actually... <laughs> Especially us, right. I hate to break it to you, but this is English in an English accent. I don't have an accent. You guys do. We we do. Well, I was I was spotting a little bit of like Midwestern is actually what I was thinking. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but uh, so how long have you how long have you been stateside? 
Um, so we came over in 2011. Um, okay. Came over with my wife's job. And yeah, it's been 10 years going strong now. Uh, we were only supposed to be here two years. Uh, my wife got a job uh, in South Charlotte um, on a two-year contract. We were going to do that, like travel, and right. then go back to London and carry on with the rest of our lives. But instead, we're here. We've got a house. We've got kids here. We, we love Charlotte. We think it's wonderful here. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's this is Everyone keeps talking about why it's a transplant city. It's like, well, you come here and you stay for a while, and you go like, hey, you know what? Yeah. This is pretty good. I'm going to dig this place. So, yeah, we're here. We're like, it's warmer than London. It's cheaper. The people are nicer. We like the food. Like, we should stay. <laughs> <laughs> makes, a, makes a good little decision yeah, to stick yeah. around. And uh, and did you did you play a lot in London as well? I mean, could as far as being a musician, like, did you play and perform in London? Yeah. Yeah, a decent amount. Yeah. So, um, I, do, you, do you want to hear my musical story? Sure. sure I'd love to. Okay. So, <clears throat> I grew up in a town called Dartford, which is in southeast London. Um, I don't know if you've read um, Keith Richards' book. Uh, in the first chapter, he described that's that's the one famous the famous thing about Dartford. Mick and Keith are from there. Okay. Uh, and in the first chapter of his book, he describes Dartford and how um, um, the German bombers who didn't want to go all the way into London they dropped their payload on Dartford and turned back around because it's kind of closer. <laughs> um, so it was, you know, this is town that was flattened uh, right. during World War Two, and uh, the, the, a lot of that hangs over it. I think. Yeah. Um, but like the 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 musical journey that I started was like in my early teens. I can remember I got my brother's copy of What's the Story, Morning Glory by Oasis. And I listened to that. And I was like, I'm going to pick up guitar. I want to learn to play every one of those songs. Yeah. And that's what I did, basically. That's and awesome. And that got me into it. And in terms of like in Dartford, there was a big ska punk scene, which was kind of unusual. Well, I think, I think yeah. that's big for, for, for London in general, like anything with horns mm. or anything yeah. in the UK, anything with horns, right? There's yeah. a big, still a big funk scene there. Oh, mm. uh, yeah. Big yeah, time. yeah. We had yeah, the influences of like, you know, the 70s scar of, yep. uh, of the UK and, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. But it was more like um, like Less Than Jake and um, yep. Real Big Fish. And yep. uh, those are yeah. the kind of bands I would always go and see. And my hometown had this really big scar scene. Like all the all the bands at my school were scar bands. Oh, that's awesome. Which is kind of weird because it, it doesn't necessarily feel like the kind of thing that should be there. You, you <laughs> think they'd all be doing Oasis tributes or whatever right. in, 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 at that time or Britpop. But it wasn't like that. So that was kind of what I, I grew up with. Um, but that that wasn't the direction I took musically. I was more into the singer songwritery stuff, and right. um, I just when I, I went to college, I went to university in a place called Southampton, um, which is where the Titanic left from. Um, and I started in a few bands. I was in two or three bands while at college. We did some um, did some reasonably reasonable sized gigs uh, with that. I was up being the lead singer and, and lead guitarist in, in a f- few bands. We supported a band called The Kooks once, which was our claim to fame. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had a big song out here a while back. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I, I pretty much didn't play a lot of guitar from when I left college until I came here, to be honest. And I picked it up again when I got here. And I thought, oh, okay. Because there's not a huge open mic scene in London. <laughs> and when you get a gig, we play at pubs, you might get 20 pounds between the band, maybe right. a pint each. Yeah. It's not quite a viable, as viable. Uh, yeah. And, um, and the way London is, p- people don't drive. Like, I didn't have a car for most of the time. So getting all your gear on so public transport is it's, it's, it's really tough in, in yeah. comparison to here, definitely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's a bit, you're a bit more prohibited as to what you can do and how far you can go and stuff. Yeah. Like, uh, we never took the step of like getting a van or anything like that. So it was always right. separate. It was, so, it was difficult. So when you guys were like hanging out in the scene in high school, was that was that was that kind of in high school in the school, or was it like you would get out of school and then go to a to go to clubs or anything like that that would yeah. have the ska bands? Around? Yeah, it was like pubs and clubs around the town that would have these kind of bands, and like there was a lot of bands in our school itself. Our school was quite musical because it was a school that Mick Jagger went to, and he um, he came when I was thirteen, fourteen. He came back and opened the Performing Arts Center, which was oh, the Mick Jagger cool. Performing Arts Center. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. So, That's awesome. Yeah, so that was, that was very cool. That was a cool day. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet. But it meant there was, loads of, there was like a bunch, three or four rehearsal rooms. You could, you could always get a room after school if you wanted one, which was great. Because Oh, that's so yeah, awesome. It was really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know, having, having that sort of ghost of Jagger in the hallways, it well, kind of it, felt like it was... It's like you it's, kind of you kind of got to. You yeah. Know? You pick up Oasis and you're like, this is amazing. This is great, you know, guitar-based rock. And I come from the school where, you know... Court, two core members of the Stones are from. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, so as far as like some of those gigging around, you say it was just like, you know, not too much money, you might get some beer, something like that. Yeah. Was there ever, was there ever any aspiration of it? Or just at that moment, it was just like kids going like, this is the greatest thing that we could do. This is, you know, 
getting out and doing whatever like there was there kind of like that aspiration of like you said getting a van or anything or was it just like just a cool community there was an aspiration among some i think i probably wasn't as motivated as i could have been to do that um i always treated it as my fun hobby which right you know it was a perfectly healthy thing to do, I think, to be honest. I, I think mean, it's, it's great. Yeah. I think more people should should be like, yeah, this is a great hobby that I love to yeah. do, and it's fun, and it's, yeah. you know, I, I don't think anyone has to be like, yeah, I'm trying to be the next Taylor Swift. Like, you don't have to be. You right, know? right. And I mean, I did, I did I'm not, not not putting myself down, I did take it fairly seriously. I, I, yeah. I made an album when I was 18 or 19. Uh, to limited fanfare, and uh, you know, haven't we all done? We, I was about to say we've all. <laughs> we, uh, I think we have my CD that we use for coasters at some point around here. So it's yeah. And uh, yeah, we had. A, I, did, I went in the studio a bunch of times with a couple of bands, and you know, I, I just it was just like a fun day in the studio kind of thing. I didn't yeah. ever think like, hey, we're going to get signed off of this. Right. But yeah, you know, you, you always dream, I suppose. There's something very interesting about not putting pressure on it and just having fun and make yeah. it it tends to be better anyway yeah, yeah you know when the band's trying too seriously you kind of get like it doesn't doesn't work as well right right yeah and i can remember we, we sort of touched on almost getting some some action in terms of like a, a contract or something um the drummer in my band his his cousin was a quite a big producer in the uk who produced a, a, a band called the stereophonics who were quite a big oh work yeah, yeah very so with and he, he, he did yeah. their first three albums and we sort of like threw him a couple demos like hey what do you think didn't hit uh, back as positively right. as we'd hoped, but uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> maybe we needed to produce it a bit better. I don't know. Right. Well, that's. I mean, you know, that's that's always a thing too. You never really know what day that guy's having. Right. You know, and it's you know if it's a favor or if it's listen to a demo or something. Because to give a little context, by the way, to to like music and growing up in the UK, mm -hmm. um, English people aren't as positive and as sort of forward-looking as Americans. That's one, one of the reasons I really love it here, because people are generally yes. have a positive disposition, generally speaking. English people tend to be, like, be a bit self-deprecating. Really? Neg no, I'm just sorry. <laughs> <laughs> very sarcastic, very dry, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and there's this perception, like, you know, that life's a bit drab, and there's two ways out. It's uh, soccer or uh, getting in a band. Right. That's like, when, you, when you're younger, it's like, if I'm going to make something, it's going to be, I'm going to you know, be on the field or I'm going to be on the stage. Wow. So like you the, chose to you chose to go in both those directions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the side of the field for, mo for the most part unfortunately. I don't quite have the uh, athletic ability to uh, to have made it a, a, as a soccer star which is, you know, it's the only sport in the UK. Right. Um and th those are like the two big things so I've in in UK culture I would argue music and sport. Oh, absolutely. So um yeah, I've, I I picked both lanes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's and it's I mean, coming here where it's just the complete juxtaposition of that as far as, especially, especially with soccer, you know, I mean, hell, we're even calling it the wrong sport technically because of how unpopular it is here. But I mean, fortunately it's growing, but mm. it's so interesting with so, like, so we, we, would you say that you were always like a massive soccer fan growing up? Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, as I say, the only two pastimes in the UK are the, the aforementioned soccer and, and, and music, like going, going to gigs and going to, going to games. It's the only things I wanted to do. And I did mm. lots of, lots of both. And, um, you know, I, I started as a as a sports writer out straight out of college. Oh, okay. That's kind of the, the path I've taken. So I've always known the sport. And so coming here, where in 2011 when I came here, where soccer wasn't huge uh, compared to now, it's a very different scene. And I'm pretty happy that an MLS team has Com landed compared in Compared to now? Yeah. Well, the, the, the anecdote I say is when if we go to the beach when we got here in uh, 10 years ago, there'll be guys throwing a ball. Now, if you go to that same beach, they'll be kicking it and they'll be wearing Barcelona shirts. That's generally the pattern I've noticed. There's been a sea change in the last decade, I'd say. So, so why do you think why do you think it's r gaining popularity now? I think the world's getting smaller. I think the internet's um, you know um, made the world a smaller place, okay. and I think Americans see that wow, this is actually a pretty good game, and they see that all the biggest sports stars in the world play soccer. It's your name, all the biggest Ronaldo, sports stars outside of the U.S. No, in general, in yeah, the world, yeah, yeah. True. yeah, play play soccer, yeah, like yeah. all the top athletes outside of the U.S. play right, soccer, right? But like, I mean. Globally, more people know who Leo Messi is than Tom Brady. I agree with that one hundred percent. You know, but yeah. with speaking within the market mm -hmm. in the U.S., that's not the case. Though. Absolutely, quite right. the opposite. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, what is it going to take to get soccer to that point in the U.S.? I don't know. Okay. I mean, I think it can. I don't think it was ever be number one sport, but I think it could. You know take a higher place than baseball. It could, it could get more bigger, you know, it, it could climb mm. the rankings, I think. But <clears> it, sure. I think culturally, 
this, the country isn't necessarily designed for it because if you're a, a really talented athlete and you're at the end of college or whatever, you're getting into college or you're at the end of high school, am I going to go in the sport that pays me a hundred grand a year or five million? A year? Right. So, <laughs> so, so, so it's, right. it's, I was talking to Todd about this actually before you showed up. I said, like, Hey man, I got some questions. And Todd was, you know, Todd was like, <laughs> Jay, oh, man. Jay came in with an agenda. <laughs> I didn't come in with an agenda. I was, I was riding <laughs> just, over here. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I, Todd had sent me your Instagram stuff and I've been looking at that some during the week. Great. And, uh, I was watching the between two pints coming over here. I was, I was listening to it. I wasn't watching it cause I was driving down the road and I could, I was listening to it. It's all views. Weeks. That's all good. Yeah. 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 So, uh, we know he was watching it right <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing, right? I, I'm I'm a little bit older than both of y'all, right? So I'm I'm in my I'm in my early 40s, and I remember the first time that I watched the World Cup, and it was a big deal, and mm-hmm. that was in the late 90s, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the U.S. has never really been competitive in in soccer in a in a in a world stage. The men, right? Yeah, the men. The, the, men. the yes. women have. Absolutely. I mean, they they won they won one, right? Well, there's no competition for the women because the women are the strongest, uh, right? Yeah, right. But, but the, there's the, the, also not a viable option for a woman in the U.S. to have a career as a soccer player. I mean, when you look at the the disparity between what the women make versus what the men make, correct? Uh, there's a big difference there. Yeah, if, sure. I, I'm, I'm not wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what the European make, men make and what the U.S. women make. Yeah, I'd agree. Even between the U.S. men and the U.S. women, there's, yeah. a, there's a big difference. There's, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, and to going back to what you said about college, right? And if I'm a top athlete in the U.S. Right, exactly. I, I don't, there's like soccer's not in my view, mm. right? And until we get to, this is me talking, but I feel like, in, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, but until we get to a point that, that a top athlete in the U.S. wants to play soccer, how do the we, money's got to. How do we make that? It's economic. That better? It's, it's yeah, economic. It's, it's all, it's all about it's capitalism. Also, it's economic at the professional level because sports mm. in the US are designed to have commercials every few minutes. Yep. The start stop. Uh, a sport where you have to go forty five minutes without having a commercial is challenging for mm-hmm. this market. I agree with that. Absolutely. Yep. And True. I think I think that's a really interesting way to look at it too, mm. <clears throat> because of the time frame with the game, right? And because you don't have those natural stops. Yeah. And and it's not TV timeouts aren't built in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You know, so, but but still, even with that, how do we? Because we we have to increase revenue to be able to pay people more money to play the sport, right? Mm-hmm. So, how do we do that? I mean, that's up to the the marketeers <laughs> to put butts on seats, I suppose. You know, Charlotte FC, for example, has got to fill that stadium every right. week. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's just a creeping cultural thing. Like uh, the Premier League, uh, yeah. NBC, since they've taken on the coverage. They do such a good job that it's really grown the sport yep. massively. So, you know, it's, it's all about how, uh, you know, put, putting more eyes on it, basically, yep. making more awareness of it. And I will, I will say going and seeing a soccer game in, I mean, in the stadium and seeing it there, it is exceptional. I mean, too, it's, it was probably one of the most, like, it was probably one of the most intense, um, fun live sports events that I've ever seen. Oh, good. To, to really see. And it was, it was also, too, I was with a guy who uh, I went in completely blind, didn't know who any of the teams were, and he's like, Arsenal is one of them. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I fucking hate Arsenal. I'm like, okay. So, uh, and then just the entire time, I realized that we're sitting in an Arsenal area, and he just keeps going, ah, screw that guy, you know, to the point where I'm like, all right, maybe we should go see if we can get some seats kind of maybe over here somewhere, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, so that was half the intensity was the stands, but also just, you know, it, it's a, you know, people say this, the same thing about hockey, right? You know, people love to watch hockey on TV. People love to see it, but you know, to see it, see it in action. It was the same thing of, of watching a soccer game in action and being there really made me go like, you know, this is something that I would, would enjoy, enjoy just as much as seeing a Panthers game. And I love going to football mm. games, you know? So I'm really excited that, it, I mean, especially for me, that's going to be, you know, 15 minutes up the road. And that soccer game you saw was a friendly? Imagine when it's Charlotte playing Atlanta and there's a rivalry and there's, <laughs> right. this, there's this hatred going in through the air. Oh, it's going to be electric. great. It's going to be yeah, great. I was, I was listening to one of the things you did when you were going around when they announced the team and you were talking to a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. You were going through the bars. Yeah. And the one guy was like, I can't wait till we beat Atlanta. And I was just like, but well, there's not a team here yet, man. Like how, like that to me for that rivalry to already be there based off of yep. an existing rivalry from football <laughs> right. opposed to soccer 
is 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 kind of it baffles me just a little bit because there's no reason for it like, because we're manufacturing it to get them to right you know, well to a little some bit excitement a right? little bit but i mean i don't think it's very hard to get any sports fan to be like nah atlanta you know here in charlotte <laughs> you know i mean it, it's it's not hard and i mean it's you know and it's not like we don't have relatives in atlanta yeah. that you know that feel the same way you know looking back looking north but um but no, I'm I'm just very excited for for doing it. So you guys, so you said March 22nd, as far as no, March 2022, 2022, 2022. What a year Sorry. out. Yeah. Sorry, I was just being hopeful. I wish it was March 22nd. I was just, <laughs> being, so was so I was yeah. just being so hopeful. It would be great, man. It's I mean, it's having the Charlotte Football Club here is a great opportunity for the city, right? Yeah. Generates yeah. Absolutely. A ton of business generates a ton of jobs, yeah. revenue for everybody. Yeah. You know, it's and it gives uh, Tepper something to do with the stadium when. Well, hey, there'll there. be 17 extra uses of the stadium yeah. plus cup games. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Which yeah. is brilliant. The thing, the thing that which really sold it to me was when Mr. Tepper did the uh, the speech at the announcement, mm -hmm. and he was saying he just the, the, he said something like Saturday nights in July it's going to be a party in that stadium. You can imagine when it's nice and warm and you've got the sun's gone down. You're in that stadium. There's a soccer game and it's a full house. That just sounds really cool. Poor Tailgating all day. <laughs> till you get there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Tailgating. This is an interesting thing. This is the difference between US fans that I've noticed and okay. sort of European fans and maybe fans for the rest of the world. You guys celebrate the day much more and the actual idea of being a fan much more. Yes. That the whole day is like a, a celebration and like a, you know, it's the build up, everything counts. In like the UK, for example, the soccer game, you might go to the pub for one drink beforehand, but it's like five minutes to three, you get in the stadium, you watch that and then you go home. There's no ceremony around it. There's no tape because because people don't. There's not like huge parking lots. There's right. no room for it. There's no room country. for it. But um, you know, it's it's a very different culture, and I love that about here. The, the, the you know, there's there's all that build up, and I, I I always think back to I I went to a NASCAR race when I first moved here, and there's a tailgate in there too, and yes. it was really fun all day, and it was like one of those the six is it the six hundred one of those big the Coca Cola Coca Cola six hundred yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. I saw, um, and actually I had a former F1 driver Juan Pablo Montoya who, who was there. And, Literally oh. running rings around everybody, as you do. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, that was that long ago. But these two guys who were sitting next to us in the in the uh, uh, track, um, they they had a they brought a cooler in and they were we got there in like, maybe like I don't know half hour early. They were pounding them. They'd been pounding them outside. Yes. As soon as the race starts, as soon as those V eights fire up, they're both like asleep on each other's shoulders. <laughs> no. I was like, but that doesn't matter because you've had the day. You've had the day. That was the experience you wanted. Exactly. And you got it. It's very interesting. I remember. Uh, tailgating the last time i tailgated at uh for coca-cola i can't remember what time the race started but i think you know it was like two or three and i was like great uh you know what what time do you guys want to get there do you guys want you know we're going to get there at, at you know like 10 or 11 or something I was like we've got a spot at seven o'clock <laughs> or so like it was some ridiculous amount of time early i'm like this is and i I'd never tailgated from that time to the you know so i was uh of course I think I think it ended up where a lot of a lot of people ended up getting a ride home by the time you know. <laughs> I think the That's person great. who drove there had somebody else come and Uber there and get their car, you know. Well, one one of the things that's been eye opening for me here is attending college sports. Like one of my good friends here has got Gamecocks tickets, so we go down a couple oh, times a year. Oh wow, yeah, it's so fun. And like that whole idea of you know all the college kids coming out for the team and like it, it can get pretty wild out there in the parking lot. And this mixture of these like nineteen year olds and. 40 year olds <laughs> yeah. next to each other there's no in between at a no college between, game yeah. there's no in between but it's weird, like i played soccer at college level in, in uh, um, back back home and like maybe three people would watch our games and a dog <laughs> and then you go to the stadium and there's eighty thousand people there and you're like okay this is a this is different it's a, it's a different it's a different vibe and yeah. feeling and yeah and it's you know it's it's almost such a um thing of thing of pride too of, of to see a great player who's coming up and you know that he's going to go pro or something you, you know like it and, and to know that he came from your school yeah. or anything like that you know but the the college rivalries will get i almost feel like college rivalries in the states are much more they're much more heated much Absolutely. more heated yeah so but, why is that <clears throat> I, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, well, okay. So we're also from Carolina, which right. where, where you have well, the, some of the hotly, most hotly contested, in my opinion. It's probably much more heated in the South mm -hmm. because traditionally in the South, we didn't have professional sports teams as quickly as the Northeast did mm -hmm. or the West or the central part of the country. Like we just didn't, I mean, you, I mean, look now, right? There's not a lot of professional sports teams in the South. You have people in Florida, you have people in Atlanta, you have, you know, you got 
you got people in North Carolina and South. I mean, North Carolina and South Carolina is even grouped together. We don't even get our own individuals. You know, it's Carolina Panthers. And, right. I mean, it's the Charlotte Hornets, but it's yeah, it's only basketball uh, basketball team in the two states. Right? I, I find the really interesting thing how people from an area will pull for a college they didn't attend. Yep. Which is kind of crazy because where yes. I come from, like, there's a class system. People were divided mm-hmm. by class, whether you're rich or poor. You could argue here it's more like people divided by race, whereas at home yes. it's more by class. Okay. So if you were like a working class person who never went to college, there's no way you'd be like, oh, Oxford University, away we go. Because they'd be like, that would be the posh rich guys. We don't want to we don't want to pull for them because we're working class. Right. So that's, that's kind of the divide in the UK and arguably the Europe. Whereas here it's, you know, it's quite different and it's like, yeah, that's that's the college in my area. I will pull for them. I think per- personally, I think that one of the reasons for that is, is a little class-based. Like, for example, I did not go to, uh, I didn't go to uh, NC State University, but my family pulls for NC State. And uh, w- one kind of theory to that is, well, one, I think, I think we're, I, I do know with, with certain people, it's, it's a little bit of latching on to a team at a time, probably a time in their lives, you know, um, that was where that team was doing really well. Like, for example, with NC State basketball, it was Jim Valvano's team. And when they won, you know, the championships and all that, and, you know, a lot of the inspirational stories about it. But one side of my family, I think it's because due to class that they were all farmers, kind of poor farmers. And that was that was your agricultural yeah, NC State's an ag school. Is an okay. ag school. Yeah. And so I think it was kind of like, if we get to go to college, that would be where it would be. Or that's the college we would want to be associated with more. A little bit of a class thing of like, if we can't if we can't get there, we want to support it. Right. So I, if you're a I Carolina think, fan, does that make, just make you a douchebag? I think that means that your family was... No, see, see, that's how deep it goes. That's how deep it goes right, right there. Right, right. Because yeah, yeah. I wanted to agree with him so hard when it makes no sense. I've, I... I meet tons of people who are from Carolina who are perfectly okay people. And, uh, are no, they though? No, I'm just, pick, I'm just, picking. is it, is there a class thing with Duke and UNC as well? Because Duke being like a private school. And... Uh, I think a little bit that, that may have been where some of that started, but, right. but their rivalry is, is the one that's ridiculous as much as, as NC state fans. The big problem with NC state fans is like, we used to kind of be in that rivalry, and and we haven't we well okay see we never no, really were. no never really I mean like like, <laughs> like state st- so, so state was already so, so the other thing right is that yeah uh, like North and South Carolina are huge basketball like like honestly yes. basketball places you know if you if you look at the teams that exist within North Carolina. I mean, there's more ACC championships and more NCAA championships probably than any other single state. I uh, mean, Duke I, has five. Carolina guess. has six. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's 11 national championships since they've been tracking it in the modern era. Wow. You know, uh, you know. You, I mean, maybe, okay, you could argue California just because UCLA had so many. And, you know, like when Lou Alcindor and all the guys were there. Right. You know, but it's – state was a football school. Yes. More so than the rest of them. Mm-hmm. Carolina was a basketball school. Then Carolina had a decent football program for a while. Then that coach left, you know. Right. And then Duke had a decent football team for a little while. And then that coach left because it's a basketball school. I right. also think, too, the fact that they are two major universities that are so close to each other. I mean, I mean, it, it really is. I mean, drive from one end of Charlotte to the other is is this, is this probably – Takes longer yeah, to takes drive longer from than Duke to, to, to drive to Duke to Carolina. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're very, very, very close together. Right, right. So I think that probably adds to that rivalry a lot. You know, it, it probably adds when you're a college kid and you go 15 minutes to the to the other bar that's also a local place, and you know, meet some, you know, see some, you know, a bunch of guys that are in Duke jerseys or something like that. It probably helps to bring fan that fire a little bit. I so, would guess. So I grew up a Duke fan. I'm a I'm a big basketball guy. I like basketball. I like the team's aspect sport of it. Uh, and I grew up a Duke fan. I grew up a Duke fan because, and really, it was by happenstance. I, the very first college basketball game as a kid I ever remember watching was an ACC championship game where Danny Ferry was playing for Duke, and, and they won. And I just remember being happy about that. And then uh, I latched on to Mike Krzyzewski as a, as a, as a coach. You know, and, mm. and appreciated what he did there and appreciated the players that came through there. Yeah. I always, always had a huge respect for Dean Smith when he was at Carolina. Uh, not as much of a huge respect for their coaches after him. Uh, you know, and it's, it, 
it's part of the culture here, much like soccer is part of the culture yeah. in the UK, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and, interesting you say about happenstance. I picked it up by, by happenstance. It always makes it always amuses me how we're all all sports fans pick up their team by yeah, happenstance. Right. It's arbitrary that I support the team I support. <laughs> right. I hate your team because you were born three miles down the street <laughs> yeah. from me. It's kind of <laughs> right. it's kind of arbitrary, isn't it, when you think about well, it? Well, and way. also, what's the the Jerry Seinfeld joke of when you get mad when a player goes to another team for more money or something, and you're like, boo, and you're like. This guy's just wearing a different shirt yeah. now, and we just—I mean, when you break it down, he was like, "Do you want to raise for your job? Sure, I'll go over here." And they're like, "You traitor!" You know, it's—it it is so funny how like how we do kind of get in those moments. Or, or for yeah. me, it was just like, you know, my my brother, my dad, my stepdad were like, "We're NC State fans," so I'm like, "Cool, me too." But the thing I, I could never compute in in the soccer world. Uh, when I was younger, I'd watch David Beckham play okay. against my team. Mm -hmm. And then next week, he'd be playing for England, the national team. I've got to cheer him. I was booing him last week. He's right. changed the color of his shirt. He's the right. same guy. Same guy. Yeah. <laughs> Annoyed me last week. Couldn't stand him. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Yeah. That, that, is, that, is, that is a little weird for sure how to do. But I mean, yeah, there's definitely been times. I mean, what was it? The, the, the 96 USA dream team for basketball. I mean, I know that that had to be a moment for uh you know for my like my brother is 10 years older than me and he, he's right. not a uh you know because he's a nc state fan michael jordan went to uh you know went to unc so so he probably really didn't pull for michael jordan or or, or you know during that time or you know support the bulls as much or anything not saying that he didn't look at michael jordan and go that's a fantastic player but i know that in that moment was probably like this is the USA Dream Team, and this is the one time I can go Michael Jordan, you know, and just really uh, fist pump for it. But yeah, it is it is interesting. You just change your shirt, you know, and so, suddenly it's it's okay. It's a little different, but it um, the the thing to me that's interesting about sports is how vehemently different the like as far as like a big live event, how it is like right away we're going to be split right down the middle and opposing opposing sides this side of the stadium is going to verse this and this this whereas like with music it's if you were to split a stadium of uh, and they can't stand each other and try to do like a like it just wouldn't work it mm. would like there's no communal thing there you know i think i think with with music you're kind of you're you're not on the roller coaster as much emotionally you know or what when you're being vested I think yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's comparable sometimes. Like if if it's a really big stadium, like I've, I've seen the Foo Fighters play like twelve times. Oh and, really? Um, one of which was Wembley Stadium. Oh, did you is, see one of their Wembley shows? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, and um, you okay. know when they come out on stage that night, and you know the roar you get, then it's just, it's the same hairs on the back of the neck kind of feeling I feel. Yeah. And, you know when they do something in the encore that's special, or is, you know John Paul Jones comes out or something. I was about to say, did you see the one where where where? Uh, yeah. Oh god. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I've seen them when they brought um, Brian May out as well before. Oh, wow. yeah. oh yeah. sweet. What did they do with Brian May? I don't think I've seen that one. Uh, tie Your Mother Down. Ty oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, and Taylor Sings, the drummer sings. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. I got to check that out. Oh, it's great. Oh, I'm gonna, <laughs> I got to look that up. That's awesome. Yeah. So you you said you've seen him 12, 12 times. Did you see him stateside as well? Since you, yeah, I've seen him a couple here? of times. I saw them at the, the Uptown, uh, the arena um, uh, before. Spectrum, Spectrum, the one in Uptown? Yeah, I think okay. it was called Time Warner back then when I saw them. Oh, saw right, them right. But yeah, I've seen them a, a few times out here, but a, a, lot, a lot of times back home. Um, uh, yeah, a big, a big, but my first, one of my first gigs, or one of my most memorable first gigs I went to was on the There's Nothing Left to Lose tour in 99. And it was when Dave Grohl and Taylor had both had a kit on stage and they did a drum off halfway through. And it was incredible. That oh, was when I used to crowd surf back then. And that was, you know, this was Brixton Academy, which is quite a relatively big venue, but it holds like 2,000 people. And it, that's like one of the best venues, I think, that place. Um, but I, I saw them... Um, I was lucky enough to, in, in the job I had, I got tickets. They used to do this thing called the iTunes Festival, the Apple thing. Yeah, I've seen, yeah, I've yeah. Oh, some yeah. live recordings so every, from that. Every yeah. night in London, at yeah. the same place in Camden, they'd have a different band. And I got my basically my two favorite bands, Jimmy Eat World and Foo Fighters, playing the same night. Oh, wow. And, oh, wow. Uh, I'm, I'm there on the front row with Dave spitting on me. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just an incredible show. I've got one more Foo Fighters story, actually. Um, Chris Shiflett from the Foo Fighters. Yes. He had a side project called Jackson. Mm -hmm. And I saw them play my college town in Southampton one time um, with my buddy. And we were like, oh, that was a great gig. And we went off to a, like a rock night music club down the street. Chris Shiflett shows up and we end up really? drinking with him all night. 
Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. That's awesome. It was incredible, and it was. I can remember there was there was some kids in this club with Foo Fighters t-shirts on. They're like, there's no, they've got no idea a member of the Foo Fighters is standing. Oh, at that's the bar so with us. awesome. It was incredible, and I remember one one moment I said to him, um, he was drinking Guinness all night. I was like, can I get can I get you a drink? Because you know it's amazing to meet you and so on. He just leaned in. He was a bit drunk by this point. He went, can I swear? Yo, yeah, absolutely. Yes. He's like, I'm a fucking millionaire. You don't have to buy me a drink. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's fucking great. It was great. He is like, in my opinion, he is he is he is the modern example of like a Brian May, a Jimmy Page, of a guitar god. Chris is. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, he's he's fantastic. He, you know, but is still like a part of a band. He's still like a key member of something like that. Like he really, to me, Chris is one of those guys who's great. He's got a podcast called Walk on the Floor, which mm. is, is great. The great to listen to. It's it's him like nerding out on Bakersfield style country music. Yeah, you know he's done he's done an album like that, hasn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's that's that's very much his vibe, and mm. I you know I I totally dig I dig him. So uh, as so as far as gigs and everything else with with what you're doing with Charlotte Football Club, is there anything else you're doing around town or? Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Jack of all trades, uh, RyanBaileyMusic.com is where you'll find uh, okay. my, my gigs. Uh, doing a lot of work for Charlotte FC, if you check out their socials. Uh, one of my main gigs at the moment is uh, I'm also a podcaster. So hey. I, I host, a, there's a podcast called The Total Soccer Show, which is a nationwide, uh, it's the biggest independent soccer podcast in the country. Uh, so oh, I'm, wow. Uh, That's it's awesome. five times a week. It's part of The Athletic. Um, so I'm, I, I do that and I do the edits and I, that's that's a lot of fun. Um, actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's a musical story out of this because okay. well, we, we, when we were doing an ad read one time, it was for, um, not StubHub, but one of those kind of deals. Uh, and I mentioned I was... I, it was when Casey Musgraves was in town. Oh, I was like, uh-huh. I love the the album, uh, the Golden Hour album. And I was like, I yeah. really want to go to this concert, but it's really hard to get tickets. And that was it was, it was just a casual comment in like an ad read. Uh-huh. And then I get a, an email the next day. Oh, hi, my name's Adam. I play bass for Casey Musgraves. <laughs> uh, would you like some tickets? <laughs> That's oh, awesome. awesome. And, yeah. and then I've become pretty good friends with him. And like he got me tickets and I went to see uh, Casey and the Foo Fighters in Vegas like at the end of 2019. Oh, wow. and, like it's Amazing the sort of, uh, you know, the things that can happen, isn't it? Nice. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, man. So what was, the, what was the name of the podcast again? Where can uh, we find Total it? Total Soccer Show. It's a, yeah, just okay. a purely soccer podcast, but we have a lot of fun on there too. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. I'll so have to you, check it out. if you want to get into, get into soccer, which is a growing sport here as we have established. Oh, well, see, now I have a year to listen to the podcast. Yeah. yeah. And then, so that way when I show up for the, for the games, I'll know what I'm talking about. I'd also like to start a podcast with Charlotte FC. I think, um, I think there'd be a good I think that would be great. for that too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, man, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Welcome, guys. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks. Three, five.